Just a boy turning 17 Took me away from my home in Abilene I was sworn I'm a soldier now I was trained to survive And from a boy I became a man We journeyed to a place called Nan Spent 13 months of living in fear They say it's over, but I'm still here Hey America, can you hear me? Don't you remember me? Hey everyone, thank you for joining us tonight on uh, this uh, podcast, Stories of Sacrifice. I've got a great guest tonight that uh, I think everybody will love to hear from. Uh, I have Dave McMillan that's joining me here in just a few minutes. Uh, Dave is from Australia. He's uh, kind of a controversial bloke, as they would like to say, I guess, down under, <laughs> since they call us Yanks. <laughs> He's down, down in the room there just laughing. Anyway, uh, I'll bring Dave up here in just one second, but uh, tonight we're going to be talking about um, some missing in action and, and uh, 
Southeast Asia, uh, more directly related to Cambodia, and uh, missing photojournalists that uh, went missing in 1970, uh, one which included uh, the son of actor Errol Flynn, which is Sean Flynn. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring Dave up and uh, let everybody meet him, and I'll have Dave fill us in on more. How you doing, Dave? How you doing, Dave? Hey, John Bear, how you going? Good, good, sir. Good, good sir. Good to have you I on love here. your intro. I love your introduction. I love the and I love the the tune. <laughs> I do too. I do too. It pumps me up. It, yeah, me too. Me too. So, uh, so uh, give us a little bit of your, uh, of your background, uh, there, background there, Dave. Uh, yeah, well, uh, quickly, I just I just want to acknowledge um, the troops that we have over in Afghanistan supporting the evacuation and withdrawal over there, and um, also want to want to acknowledge that this mission. It goes across administrations, and I've been involved in this since President George W. Bush. So um, I want to acknowledge the U.S. government at, during this hard time as well and uh, send my respect out to uh, everybody in America, all my brothers in America and my family in America in Nebraska and my family in California before yeah. we get started. And, uh, yeah, like uh, – this is my first podcast since um, I I kind of I became a I became a bit of a Karen a COVID Karen <laughs> on a couple of my Facebook podcasts and I got myself in serious trouble. So um, I also want to acknowledge the really good job that the the men and women in blue are doing now during this crisis all around the world. Um, our police yes. uh, and our essential workers are uh, like really really um, doing a, a superb job. So yeah, um, I'm real. And today, uh, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. I had some hard times recently, and um, the only thing that I could do to prop prop myself up is to play your podcast and listen to it. And yeah, so I like it very. And uh, I really love the one with um, uh, Master Master Chief. I think is it um, Derek yeah, Van Orden. He, he yep. was man is really really excellent. I really liked the the way that you represented everything then. Yeah, that guy's been around the world and then some. Yeah, man, he's he's amazing. He's, he's seen more shit than any any of us will ever see. <laughs> yeah, no so, doubt. Well, kind of give me a background, a little bit of your background on your family. Um, I, I follow you on Facebook quite a bit. We're friends. Um, yeah. Just think of, talk a minute about your grandfather. Uh, so... My grandfather was a Gordon Highlander, which is Scottish soldier, uh, regimental soldier. And my family, they were in the Highland regiments for a long time. My grandfather was a career soldier and uh, he served in the Peshawar Valley in, Afghan and in Afghanistan, um, in the Khyber Pass up in India and Pakistan region and um, in Palestine. My grandfather had... Um, a whole bunch of combat experience in the Peshawar Valley and back in the 1920s and the, into the 30s. And um, my grandfather came back after doing a whole bunch of service in the, for the British colonies. And um, as soon as he got back, he started working at the Woolwich Arsenal and um, down in, in near, I think it's in London or whatever. And um the ammunition factory, but he started to train up all of the, all of his unit because they were expecting war. And my grandfather trained for like two years from 38 and then to 40. And then they mobilized in 1940. My grandfather, he was posted on the Maginot line. So uh, my grandfather was a corporal and he was on the Maginot line. So they were, the Gordon Highlanders were all lined up on the Maginot line in a defensive perimeter and they didn't expect Hitler to go through I think it's the Ardennes forest and cut through Belgium and all that and um, so my grandfather and his guys were pretty much they were they were there right at the outbreak of war and my grandfather was killed and he he was one of the first casualties allied casualties of the second world war because like that thing was the that was uh, that's all pre-Dunkirk that's like the all the events that happened that led to um, the escape from like uh, the evacuation of Dunkirk. 
So my grandfather was killed in the evacuation, but because he was killed so early on in the war, um, it, it took a very long time for um, the War Graves Commission and, and the British government to ascertain like that where he was because he was kind of like a LKA, like a last known alive case that we have with the MIAs in, in America because they thought that he, he could have been alive. So when my father was small, my father, my, my um, grandmother used to take my father around all these invalid hospitals in Europe and like look at all these dudes who are all deformed and blown up from war and like try to work out if that was my dad's father. So my father's like, that was my father's life experience. The first eight years of his life, like being dragged around these hospitals, trying to find this MIA person and hearing like people saying MIA all the time. So yep. Yep. when I grew up, my dad, like he, he carries that. He always carried it with him. And like, because of that, that obsession with the MIA thing, my dad, always spoke to me about it like um and it was just in my blood because my grandfather is MIA and you know he was MIA and you it just I don't know it's just something that's that that um it's hard to explain I think people like Anne Mills Griffith who uh, works with the leagues of families um, people like her she understands because uh, um her brother was an MIA. There's a lot of people that are involved in the POW MIA community or that do this work who have family members that were lost or missing in action or killed in action in the war. So um, there's some people that get into this kind of work because of um, it's a direction that they go through in their government career. And then there's other people who end up a part of it, like a, my deceased friend Donna Elliott, her brother Jerry Elliott, Case 1000, he went missing in Khe Sanh in Vietnam. And um, Donna went over to Vietnam maybe a dozen times looking for her her brother walking up in an area that had so much UXO there. All The the first 10 times she went there, there was bombs all over the trail and everything. It was cleared the last few times. But there's, there's people out there who have been directly impacted through this with their and um, through this issue via their family and um, I suppose some people they take that the dedication towards that loved one and they put it into this kind of work and um, so with me it's a family thing I didn't I didn't choose to really know about it I was just born into a family where it was an issue so yep. that's from a, my family perspective yeah, and see, a lot of people don't know your background with that, and and, and uh, you know having your family live with that, and it, and it just doesn't go away one generation to the next. It stays, that, that it, it stays forever, in my opinion, until the family yeah, well, some kind of closure. Yeah, well, when when you look at it, um, I know that. See, my father did a lot of work with me looking for um, people missing journalists and also US service people and um, European citizens. My father worked with me in Cambodia doing all those type of things. And my father and I got to a point that we became conscious of the fact that he and I working together and there's always this thing like that keeps on pushing us beyond, pushing us beyond with the work, like that stopped us from giving up. And it was like, my father and I, when we were doing this work, we were tr- trying to f- kind of find, uh, even though it's an impossible task, it was like we we're trying to find my grandfather, although my grandfather didn't die in Cambodia and we know where his grave is, it's, it's the same kind of thing. And and that's it. Yeah, it's like multi-generational trauma, but um, and it manifests in a particular way. And then when I found out recently because – um, a whole bunch of stuff had been declassified and we got it released about my grandfather that the reason why the government had just told us that he was MIA was because he was like killed very early on in the war. And it was kind of like whatever that, whatever was going on, it was kind of classified or something by the British government for a long time. Mm-hmm. So, um, so really, <laughs> 
Um, my grandfather wasn't technically MIA ever, but because of the fact that how he was killed, he was he'd carried he was carried as MIA. Like he should have. It was just you know they didn't have any information at that time about who was killed in action at the very beginning of the Germans overrunning overrunning France. So yep. yeah, so unfortunately he did like something like a dozen years overseas as a as a soldier and like um but and he survived that he uh, i heard a story about my grandfather he fell asleep one night and um he had his rifle chained to his arm and this was in afghanistan or yeah and he had a rifle chained to his arm and he woke up and there was a long knife underneath his jaw and it, there was this Bedouin with a knife to his jaw and my grandfather thought he was going to cut his throat and the guy just took a pair of pliers and cut my grandfather's rifle and just snuck out of the tent with his rifle and, and went. <laughs> yeah. So he was in, he was in, my grandfather was into some heavy duty stuff, I think. <laughs> right. So what, uh, yeah, so what, what took uh, you from Australia to, uh, to Vietnam? Vietnam. Uh, so my father took a job in the oil and gas industry in Vietnam for Petro Vietnam, which is a national Vietnamese um, oil and gas industry um, company. And uh, my dad, before he worked for Chevron, US companies and stuff like that too. And I've got a lot of friends that work for the, a lot of friends from the US who work in the oil and gas over there. But um, yeah, I originally went over there to see my father and I just really fell in love with Vietnam. And as you know, I have a, high profile over there. I'm famous in Vietnam and um, I've got a lot of friends over there. And Is that uh, famous when I, famous? sorry. Is it famous or infamous? Uh, no, I'm famous in Vietnam. <laughs> Maybe I'm infamous in Australia and in America, but I'm actually famous, go. legitimately famous. It's kind of like um, that movie uh, uh, Lost in Translation, like Satori time type of stuff. Like I'm ridiculously famous in Vietnam because of my work over there, which is, I'm lucky, very lucky for that to have happened for, they acknowledged, they acknowledged my work over there. But when I first got to Vietnam, um, my dad introduced me to this Australian guy and this Australian guy, he was involved in MIA POW stuff. And he had this friend who was involved in the JTF and was very high up in the JTF. And I had heard about Sean Flynn through the song, Sean Flynn by the clash. Yeah, and, for, uh, for our listeners that don't know what JTF is, that's Joint Task Force Full Accounting. Yeah, so um, my friend, um, my friend worked for the JT. My my Australian friend that I was drinking with, he introduced me to his friend that was from the JTF that was on leave, and this guy, his name was Michael Henshaw, and he and I we had some beers at this bar called the Cajun Club in Vungtau, and. I was just like asking because, you know, it was the first time I ever met anybody that did this kind of work. And I was like 23 years old or something. And I was very curious and I was drinking beers and, sh and stuff. And I was, you know, I was fascinated about missing people. And I was like saying, oh, what happened to this person? What happened to that person? And all this type of shit. And ex he was explaining to me that his job because he'd been doing it for years and he's one of the most experienced people. And, um, explained to me the complexities of some cases. And there was a couple of cases I asked him about and I said like, Oh, you know what happened? And he was like, Oh, kind of, well, if you really want to know, they just will kind of walk the person out the back and they didn't even know, let him know what they were going to do. And they just boom, shot him in the back, stuff like that. I was like, Oh wow, man. Like just told me all this real crazy stuff and we're having beers together. And, um, my friend, he'd lost a whole bunch of friends in the helicopter crash a few years beforehand. And, um, and he said to me, he had this thing like he wanted to do something and uh, he wanted to set something up. So when he was retired, he had like um, he had something to do with his time that was related to looking for POWs in Southeast Asia. And because I was there in Vietnam on the ground, he said to me, you know, we can work on stuff over in Cambodia, like, you know, work on stuff. If you're interested in this, I can help you and I, I can put this thing together. So when I'm retired, we can work together on this. But, you know, you're a good candidate for me to help me with this type of stuff because you have good contacts and all this. So um, after that, 
I got a security job in uh, Ho Chi Minh City working for a company called International Security and Protection, which is run by an Australian guy who's a part of former member of the second commando regiment. And so when I arrived, in, but the company is owned, partly owned by the Vietnamese Ministry of Public Security, which is police company. So mm -hmm. I arrived in Saigon and I was working for a company that was Australian and Vietnam police owned. And I was like an operations manager for the security company. And my tasks at that time was to liaise with the Vietnamese police and go all around Vietnam and go and speak to the police and drink like three or four cartons of hot Heineken beer with them on the spot there or whatever and become friends with them. And then right. my other job was, was when I was back in Saigon, I had to go and meet with some guys who worked at the U.S. Embassy that were working in the security field at the U.S. Embassy. And um, so I, I made a lot, of, a lot of important friends and a lot of really good friends back during the day, um, the the Bush, George W. Bush days. And uh, over the years, um, I became involved in uh, Tim Page's, Tim Page, the famous photojournalist. He was, he was going to do a search and uh, I became involved in that. So that's how I first started to become, uh, I started to learn the information which led me to, find the remains that I found but um, in, in about 2006 in Saigon when I was still running the security company and uh, uh, I, I met Tim Page and because I had a lot of contacts and I could speak Vietnamese he asked me to help him to research some stuff and I took all of the things that he gave me and um, he gave me a, a report by this journalist called Matt Frangiola. And in that report, it was talking about, um, it was a 19, March 1975 interview that the US journalist Matt Frangiola did with this Khmer Rouge defector by the name of Heng Peng. And this guy, Heng Peng, he was working as a medical intern in this hospital and then he'd like, they worked some shit out like that. He, they wanted to purge him and he ran away. But when he was working as a medical intern, there was two prisoners that were held at the hospital, two foreign journalists. And he said that one was a Caucasian and he identified that Caucasian by the eight by tens that Matt Frangiola showed him of all the missing journalists. He identified the one of them as Sean and Sean Flynn. And he said that, um, the other one that there was two of them, one was a tall white guy who looked like Sean Flynn. The other was a short Japanese guy that the white guy had been killed by order of the local Khmer Rouge commander with a lethal injection. And that the um, Asian guy was stubborn, like had an obstinate kind of temper and he refused to take food and protested after they took his boots. So they beat him to death. And this is the the information that Tim Page Tim Page has got had gotten from Matt Frangiola. He gave me that report, so I took that report to the Documentation Center of Cambodia and I asked them if they had any similar reporting in Khmer from the the Khmer Rouge records, and they found a whole bunch of information, like 14, 16 documents or something like that in Khmer. And then, so I got all those documents, I translated them, I gave them to Tim and to um, his his team. And uh, then really kind of nothing, nothing was coming of it. And then Mike and I were over the, over the years, Michael Henshaw and I had kept up um, our correspondence and Michael had been teaching me how to do a whole bunch of different things and sending me manuals about mortuary affairs. And to, essentially Mike told me like, you have to study everything about like, this joint in this joint operations mortuary affairs manual because like all of these different things in here they're all going to be important when you go in the field so for the first few years I was, I was studying all of that then my brother and I we were we had a look back at the information from the Tim Page interview uh, I mean the Tim Page work and my brother was like man let's call up Tim and say hey Tim let's go over to Vietnam I mean go over to Cambodia and and look into the into that information so I, I called up Tim 
and he'd just gotten home from Afghanistan. He was over there embedded as a photographer. And I told him, like, I was like, hey, Tim, I've got this information. Um, I've got even more information that, that we're researching before, and I'm looking at going into Cambodia. And he said, oh, I just got back from Afghanistan. I, I'll, I'll be interested in that, but maybe in a few years, mate. I'm not interested. I'm sorry. I, I Yeah, just uh, I'm not interested. So he hung up on me, and then I was like, okay, well, he's not interested. So, okay, what should I do? So I contacted Rory Flynn. I got Rory Flynn's contact and I sent her an email with all of the, the documents. I was like, I don't know what else to do, but here are the documents. So um, I sent all the documents to Rory and then that's when I first met Mike, Mike Luring, who works for Rory. And Let's back up one uh, second. Yeah. Why don't you uh, give us a little more background on Sean Flynn and, uh, and uh, you know, his, his the, the information surrounding his disappearance or his capture by the. Okay, so essentially, Sean Flynn was Errol Flynn's only son. He was his mother was Lily Demeter, who is the she was a famous French movie. Uh, star as well so he both of his parents were movie stars he was a bit of a in the into the movies a bit himself too but he didn't really like it he didn't think that it was a genuine approach to life and uh he did a whole bunch of b-grade movies i think it disappointed him with cinema but yeah I think he continued to make movies son of captain yeah. Blood or, something. Blood or something yeah son of captain blood but there's a couple of good ones that he made, like Stop Train 346, or I think it's something like that. It's like a, it's a Cold War one when he plays like a U.S. officer on a bullet train between yeah, Berlin. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Officer, yeah. yeah, and uh, then then the, the last one that he did was called Five Ashore in Singapore, which is strange because if you watch that film, it's about a U.S. guy who gets abducted into some type of Manchurian candidate things and uh, – then like two years later he got abducted himself um sean yeah so sean he arrived in vietnam i believe in about 65 he was there for about five years until 1970 when he went missing and yeah, he some that, pretty, interesting, yeah. pretty interesting pretty interesting background there when he was in vietnam and yeah like, well he yeah that's right here well when he he arrived in saigon he was pretty fresh and he had a brand new camera that he bought in singapore and then he started to run with the crew that they call the Saigon Cowboys. So like Joe Galloway, who was just recently deceased, and uh, um, uh, Tim Page, Matt Frangiola, Dana Stone, Michael Herr. Um, these guys were legendary journalists. Larry Burroughs was there at that time before he got killed. Larry Burroughs was a British journalist who messed up Robert Kappa's World War II D-Day photos. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, but, and he's the one who died in the crash up in, um, in Laos, the helicopter crash. So there was a whole bunch of these legendary guys and um, Sean Flynn, his, his father had been in the Spanish Civil War as a journalist and he wanted to be like his father type of thing. And um, he became deeply involved in the war. And these guys, they used to ride out to, the war on motorcycles and uh, go out and, or just hitch helicopters around and just jump off and take photographs. And um, they were really incredibly brave people. They're probably the, the bravest generation, the bravest people. And uh, a lot of the people like you have to remember people like Tim Page, when he first got involved in it, he was like 16 or something. He, he went to Southeast Asia when he was 16. So him he met uh, Sean and Sean and Dana and Tim Page were very close friends and um, Perry Dean Young, all these guys who have went on to become very legendary journalists and they lived a, an adventurous life as these kind of swashbuckling photo journalists in Saigon and in the countryside in Vietnam and uh, the Vietnamese communists, they respected journalists and they, because they also, they understood the political ramifications of killing a western journalist like there was journalists that were killed in vietnam like robert cap was killed in vietnam but the vietnamese didn't target those journalists those journalists were like killed in the line of fire or something like that the vietnamese they uh 
always avoided the journal, avoided trying to hurt the journalists. But then Sean, he had arrived back in, uh, in Vietnam and he was thinking about retiring because he'd done about five years a- as a journalist. And in the time before he had, had arrived back to Saigon, he'd taken some time off from being a journalist because he, he'd been wounded and he wanted to get out. And he went to Papua New Guinea and searched for Michael Rockefeller and, oh, uh, and, that. and that. yeah. And he took a whole bunch of photos of all of these, uh, the Danny tribe in, in Papua New Guinea. And he brought marijuana with him and he gave cannabis to the Danny tribe. And he so he took all these photos of the Danny tribesmen after they'd smoked pot, like they'd never smoked cannabis before. They're like the most ancient men in the world. And, um, and, but yeah, he was looking for Michael Rockefeller and, and also following his father's footsteps in Papua New Guinea. And so when he arrived back in Saigon, they heard that there was a whole bunch of trouble going on over in Cambodia. So everybody ran, had been over in camp, uh, had been over in Cambodia before all of these guys, they used to holiday there like Sean, you know, I think in 69 or uh, yeah, 68 or 69, He'd taken a motorcycle trip around the Cambodian countryside before the coup d'etat and it had been safe, pretty safe. And um, he told uh, some other people, he told some people that had interviewed him that his intentions were to go on like a big kind of easy rider motorcycle journey across Cambodia. And so they got over there and... um, uh, they weren't supposed to go there. Journalists were prohibited from entering and they were told by the Khmer Republic and by the Khmer Rouge that they that the journalists, there was no such thing as journalists and that they were the enemy. So a lot of journalists came in as like used car salesmen or whatever. They just changed <laughs> what their profession was to come in and uh, they all they all got there into Saigon, um, into Phnom Penh, and they started. They rented out like Peugeots and and um, and like motor. And Sean and Dana got motorbikes. But at first, actually, Sean and Dana they went they went in a Peugeot, and they were going out in the countryside to where the near where the bombing was happening, and where they knew that there was communist activity out near the border, and uh, they. Would had they had they driven up to a position and Sean was taking photos and then out of the jungle walked all of these Cambodian communist guys, but they didn't see the car and they just like walked across. So it was like a close call. This is a, maybe three days before he went missing or something. Okay. And uh, so there was a close call. And then, so because of that close call, he decided that he wasn't going to be driving in a car that the, what they were going to do is they were going to go to Phnom Penh and they were going to rent some brand new Honda motorcycles and they were going to go there on the motorcycles because they were more mobile and, uh, you know, so fast or whatever. And um, so there there had been some fighting out in the border and uh, the Khmer Rouge had attacked all of these villages and, and checkpoints and blown them up and the journalists had left from... Phnom Penh and they were based out in Svaiting, uh, the city there. And they were going from Svaiting out to Chipu, which is about, oh, I say it's about 20 miles, uh, no, 20, no, 20, yeah, 20 kilometers or something. No, 20 kilometers. It's not far. 20 kilometers. It's about 20 kilometers away. So they were going out 20 kilometers and uh, there was a roadblock out there in that area that they'd known about. And uh, they found out one day that uh, some journalists hadn't returned. Uh, some French journalists and some Japanese guys hadn't returned. And uh, they're out at like a press briefing at one of these blown up places. And they heard that these guys had went to drive back to Saigon, but um, uh, they, they'd never, they'd never returned and nobody had heard from them. So, the Sean and Dana went out there with uh, like a, a convoy. There was a Khmer Republic Army convoy that went out there to check what was going on. And they found like this Peugeot, uh, white Peugeot shot up in the center of Highway 1, like blocking the road. And uh, Sean and Dana, they kept on 
riding their motorbikes up and buzzing the checkpoint type of thing and trying to get photos of because at the checkpoint there was these uh cambodian communist guys like hiding behind the car and stuff with machine guns they could see all these guys and with them was the Khmer Republic Army. The Khmer Republic Army had come up beside them and they were like covering either side. And the journalists, there was French journalists there as well. They were asking like the convoy, are you going to, are we going to go in and take this village and, and uh, see what happened to these guys who'd been captured with the Peugeot? And um, the Cambodians didn't want to go any further because they saw some guys had run off to go and get, uh, people, some dudes in the distance had run off. So they said no. They had armoured cars and stuff, but they said no. So uh, they withdrew. And from what Mike Luring and I have been able to ascertain, uh, Mike also spoke to one of the last people to see Sean. Sean and Dana were buzzing around in that area and Sean wanted to take um, his camera up to um, a small hill beside the village near where he went missing to take a panoramic photograph. And that was the last that was ever seen of him. When we have a look at the uh, information of what happened to Sean and Dana that we've learnt from uh, oral eyewitness testimonies at, through the U S government's investigations over there, the open source documents that we have in the library of Congress. And uh, from what I understand of the, that local area, they had a, a fishing cast net that they had from what that they could pull from one side of the highway to the other. And uh, the gorillas ran off and they grabbed some civilians and some other just random guys in the village to come and help them catch Sean and Dana. And some kids, they jumped on either side of the highway. And when Sean and Dana buzzed up on their motorbike, because they buzzed it like three or four times on the motorbike the, where the car was, but on the, the third or the fourth time when they buzzed it, guys had gotten back around them and pulled up like this fishing net over the highway so they couldn't take their motorbikes. They couldn't run away with the motorbikes. And that's how they were captured and that they tied them up with blankets and um, blindfolded them, took all of their belongings and then move them to an area um nobody's exactly sure uh may i'm i'm not 100 percent sure there's a there's a whole bunch of different scenarios that i've heard and i don't know what is true and what is what what is the public the what the public knows and what's classified whatever about that situation but from what i understand sean was killed within a few hours or a day or so of being captured in that area. He was, they were pretty much immediately killed and their belongings were sold by the Cambodian soldiers for alcohol. So that's a, that's a, one of the saddest things about it because when I try to try to find why they were killed, it was a crime of opportunity, but uh, and these guys, they weren't, they weren't like uh, uh, soldiers, communist soldiers, or anything like you. You would, you would figure that these guys are the idealistic Khmer Rouge of 1975. They weren't. These guys were a mixed bag of people who were had been fighting for Sihanouk before the coup d'état. So there's a whole bunch of guys who were on the American side, kind of, or neutral, or that were working for Sihanouk who weren't getting paid after the coup d'etat. All these soldiers out in the countryside and their government had been toppled, so they were just like loose change. They didn't have they did they they didn't have they weren't on anybody's payroll anymore, and they were like the but they were the local security guys in the area. So essentially, those guys worked out okay. So if we've got we light up this village over here and we shoot up this car these dudes are just going to keep on coming and we're just going to keep on catching them and then like robbing them and killing them and uh that's what we're going to do and that's essentially what happened to those guys yeah yeah and, and a lot of people might think that they were haunting them and that's how they got captured but there was there's a lot of there were, well, there was a few journalists that were trying to get captured intentionally back then, 
and then because they would because be they captured, would be captured would get a great story and then story and then get released get released so i don't think so sean would think sean was thinking, thinking that they would be held very long very my opinion. Opinion. My opinion. well yeah but the the thing is is he's um yeah that's probably true but also i think he knew that he knew the stakes he knew how how dangerous it, it was because those guys had they'd nearly been captured a few days before but yeah maybe he didn't understand the ramifications but um from what i've read in the documents sean could speak vietnamese and sean tried to sean and dana tried to explain their way out of it to these cambodian guys in vietnamese and there was another camp but there was another vietnamese guy there a, a viet a via viet cong guy who was like a supply um supply officer he would drop off supplies and everything on the border and he he saw these cambodians cruising along with the american captives and he's like what's going on they're like oh we're going to kill these americans he's like whoa 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 and he tried to speak to them in vietnamese and then these cambodian guys said they've invaded my country and the vietnamese guy was like no don't kill them don't kill them and then they said uh, to the vietnamese guy uh either you help either you help us and you sell you give us money and help us sell this guy's belongings and you come and help us kill these guys or we'll shoot you <laughs> like this is our country this is cambodia you're from vietnam you can't tell me what i can do with these prisoners in my country that's what the that's what the the narrative is apparently to but before they were killed and um from what i understand they were just um taken to a isolated area not far from the the road where they were captured and uh, a few k's away or something and they weren't even told what was going on. They were just walked out at uh, about five o'clock in the afternoon to an area. And uh, there was two Khmer communist soldiers and both of them uh, shot one of the journalists each. So Dana and Sean, they were blindfolded and they just took them out to the field and shot them and then uh, buried them. And uh, yeah, so the... The, the mystery, however, started in uh, Phnom Penh and Saigon of what had happened to them. And people wanted to believe that they were alive for a long time and people held out. But you see that all of their colleagues, they held out hope for a very long time. But, no, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't just their colleagues, and I want to mention something here. Uh, Dana Stone, he, you know, he's kind of the... You know, he doesn't receive a lot of the limelight like Sean does. But uh, Dennis, Stone's Dennis Stone's brother, John Thomas Stone, I don't know if you heard about him. Yes, I have. He ended up joining he, because of his brother going missing in act, or his brother being captured. He he decided, John decided to uh, join the Army in 1971 and try to go over there and look for his brother. Um, John served... I don't know how many years in the in the army. Uh, he later served as a medic in the Mon Army National Guard, and he was killed by friendly fire on March 29, 2006, at the age of 52 in Afghanistan. So I just wanted to mention, you know, how, like we were talking. He's a hero. About, yeah, he was a hero. Yeah, my friend Michael Henshaw. He's one. He's uh, one of the military members that are. Uh, there's like a group in within the military that are kind of that that are fans of that guy Tom Tom Stone. He's like yeah. in the military. He's they they look up to that guy. He's he's like a big hero within their community. So yeah, that that's true. Um, the Stone family were very uh, were very talented and very brave. And um, yeah, good. so. A close friend of mine is in the Vermont Army National Guard, and actually they're uh, deployed over to Kosovo right now. And uh, the major that I'm real good friends with, he's he was friends with Tom. So awesome. that's my my connection to this story. Oh, great! Yeah, before before my friend and I, my friend's deceased now, but um, I remember a, a good friend of mine from America. He came over with us on one one of our missions, and he uh, gave us a 
Sean Flynn and Dana Stone's um, MIA POW bracelet from America. He he got those bracelet. He gave me he gave me those bracelets as a gift. It's really right. cool. Yeah, yeah. So with uh, get into this a little more here. There was a video that came out here the other day, and it kind of kind of put you in a kind of a limelight that it wasn't accurate. And so I just, so I just the, the whole thing for this was to kind of clear the air on that a little bit too, um, that you're not some bone hunter and some <laughs> loose gun. That's you're yeah. actually serving a purpose for your family. You're you're working directly with uh, Sean's sister and in the Mike Luring. And uh, yeah, I don't know if a lot of people know that that you're directly involved with the family. Yeah, so um, I've been working with the Flynn family since I sent them the, that information pertaining to that uh, the Matt Frangiola research that uh, and the Documentation Center of Cambodia research. Um, so I sent my information about what had happened to uh, about the the journalists that Matt Frangiola's information about what had happened to the foreign journalist in Cambodia. And uh, I forwarded that to Rory and then I got involved with Mike and Mike was asking me to go into Cambodia and look into the information. And at that time I'd broken up with my first wife and I was up in the pagoda in Vietnam and I was like meditating at this Zen Buddhist pagoda and I wanted to become a monk because I'd given up alcohol and stuff. And uh, Mike and Rory kept on sending me these emails like come into Cambodia, come into Cambodia. And I was, I just wanted to sit there on the mountain for a while. And then finally I was like, okay, well I'll do it. And um, I contacted Mike Henshaw and Mike Henshaw, he sent me the coordinates that led me to um, the witness Duk chain that you have the video of. He sent me the, he sent me the coordinates and um I think, you know, that that was information about I was following up on information that the U.S. government had from their previous um, interviews with that individual. And that's where I got the GPS coordinates from. So although I did some research with Tim Page, what got me on the location there wasn't it had nothing to do with him. It actually had it was information given to me by my um, my source in the U.S. government that I was working with. And I went out to that location with my brother my brother and uh, a Cambodian guide and I found an eyewitness and interviewed the eyewitness and then uh, at first I didn't really listen to his information I came back with my my brother and my friend Scott Brantley who's an American private investigator from Kentucky Tennessee area and uh, we went we went back into Cambodia and we went behind the field hospital and we were following the information from the Matt Frangiola report that this guy had been buried behind the field hospital. And we were digging inside like the, um, what we knew to be the Cambodian, um, the, the field hospital, the field hospital cemetery. So we were digging in this field hospital cemetery, like Cambo Khmer Rouge field hospital cemetery trying to find remains but it, it turned into like a cassava plantation so it was really impossible to find anything in that area and we'd spoken to the eyewitness when we the first arrived on the location and he told us like someone's buried right here and it just seems to the human mind when something like that happens it's like it's too convenient so i kind of just ignored it type of thing you know and then um uh, I went in, interviewed him, and then after I, I did the interview with him, my friend uh, Scott Brantley and I interviewed him, and then we went back into the jungle, into digging, and then we heard f about six days later that the eyewitness that we'd spoken to had passed away from cholera, dysentery type of infection, and that it happened very quickly, that he'd... he'd, he'd um drank some bad water and then got like diarrhea and dysentery and died within about five or six hours. And uh, Dang. so, yeah, so we went into the village to, because they had no running water. It was all, it's all dirt and um, it's near a creek, but it's, 
mosquito infested. And uh, we went in there and he had a whole bunch of kids and some older kids. The older kids were okay, but the younger kids, about five or six of them, uh, aged between two to seven or eight, I'd say, um, they all had similar symptoms to the old man. And uh, we went from there back into Kampong Chum that night and Scott Brantley and I, we went to the chemist and Scott bought all of this medicine. And then uh, he and I, we went out there the next day and we contacted that med doctors without borders, medicine Sans frontier, but they said they couldn't help. And we asked all these other people to help and they wouldn't help. So Brantley and I, we went out there and we donned our gloves and everything, our MOPP. And um, we took, some uh, white man medicine out there, some antibiotics <laughs> <laughs> and uh, antibiotics and, and stuff like that. And uh, we knew that the kids hadn't ever taken or they'd never taken aspirin or Panadol or antibiotics or anything like that before. So that white man medicine probably saved them because they, they were all dying and they were going to, they're going the same way as their dad. And uh, so we, we treated them and then we continued to do what we were doing over the other place. And for the first maybe two days, we were very nervous because we didn't know if they were going to pull through or not. And then uh, we uh, decided uh, to go and check on them when we came in and everybody, all the kids had recovered in the village and the mother was very thankful. And then um, I, I started to think to myself, well, you know, it, maybe this is an omen that I should have listened to that old guy. Like maybe this is an omen that I have to dig where he wants me, where, you know, where he told me to dig. He, he went to great detail to tell me about this. And uh, I just ignored him because to me in my brain, it was too convenient. The, the puzzle, you know, like to me, it was a puzzle. I looked at the whole situation like a puzzle. And if you arrive and you've given the, for the, the most important piece of the puzzle when you first arrive, like, you know, you don't at first, it's hard to believe, but, right, um, right. so we, we, we went and we took the Cambodian mine action group unit five with us. Um, and we had Japanese made magnetometers and we did a landmine clearance of that area and a UXO sweep surface sweep, we, we took the magnetometer too, which is, was it, that goes down deep. And we had like the other ones, which are surface sweepers, but we swept the whole thing with all of this Japanese technology. And um, we found a 308, like a, something which was about, this, about the size of a, about a 308 caliber bullet and a, the jacket uh, that was rusted there above the grave. And we'd been told by the eyewitness that they tried to shoot this guy, but the the bullet had jammed and that they'd ejected the bullet and cleaned the chamber and tried again but it didn't work so they clubbed him to death so when we found that 308 bullet like we, we essentially knew that um or we we didn't know for sure but we we thought well we've got a pretty good chance that this grave is underneath here if there's a 308 bullet up on top of here you know yeah. Yeah, that's the story is all lining up. I'm going to play a quick, quick clip. I should have played it a minute ago, and I, I have some audio clip too from from uh, Mike Luring, who's also represents the family. Um, Mike gave me some good audio clip to play in here, but it was about uh, oh, 20 minutes long, so I ain't going to be able to play all his. But for those that like audio podcasts, I'm going to put a lot of those in the audio podcast. But uh, I'm going to jump back here real quick. Here, um, it's it's just a little small piece of video that uh, Rory had put together. Put together. The son of Errol Flynn, he was the most exploitable missing journalist during that time. I met Mike Luring 12 years ago. He is a devotee of the Vietnam War. He had relatives that were in the war. He heard about my brother and we met and he and I decided to try to find him. We brought on Dave McMillan, 
who is an Australian. He is an adventurer. He is definitely a cross between Errol Flynn and Crocodile Dundee. Yeah, so that's how it's finding the remains right yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. I've got yeah, another I've little clip we'll play later on that, too, I think. But I, I just yeah, wanted our, just our listeners to hear, to you know, in Sean Flynn's sister's own words, how she brought you and Mike both on uh, to uh, work this case. Yeah, so the person that um, the person that I've worked with, the most out of all of this is Mike. We we worked. We've been working in concert on this together. So um, we started out on the Sean Flynn case, and we've we've both also worked for U.S. authorities inside Cambodia on um, projects and uh, MIA investigations. Uh, Mike and I and uh, Mike Henshaw we investigated cases related to um, Terry Reynolds and Alan Hirons, the Australian and the American that were kidnapped, the journalists that were kidnapped there in, uh, near Kampong Liu in um, Kandal in Cambodia. And also uh, I, I saw your podcast about Jerry Shriver. I can tell you that I was, I'm the last one or the most up-to-date one before the, the COVID outbreak that was uh, in investigating that case i investigated that case for the u.s government jerry shriver's case and unfortunately um our operation was cancelled just before we were about to mobilize but um we had a look at the schematics the government schematics uh henshaw henshaw and i looked at the government schematics that they have of the puddles out there where they believe shriver's buried and um with our gpr our ground penetrating radar process we knew that that location we calculated the amount of time and the amount of space and uh based on our operations before we considered that if jerry was buried there that we would have had those bones within two or three days so hopefully one day we can get back there because we'll be able to get mad dog's remains but um yeah, yeah. i've been on i've i've worked on multiple MIA cases inside um, Cambodia with Mike Luring as well. And um, Mike has spent a lot of time working with the French authorities about the missing French people. There's about 40 French people that went missing during that time period. Yep. So, yeah, uh, pretty much every single case in Cambodia that relates to a US MIA I've been involved in in some way or I've been like I've had to investigate or research in some manner. So, yeah. 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 I'm going to go... So, for an Australian, I'm pretty knowledgeable about American history in Southeast Asia. Yeah. Yeah, you're not just yeah. out there as a bone collector, are you? Yeah. So, like, yeah, uh, a, lot, a lot of the time that when we were working in Cambodia, I was reporting to the defense attache at the U S embassy. So I don't know how many bounty hunters do that. <laughs> yeah. For, for those of you who are wondering what we're talking about, I'll put a link to that video video that we, that we've been referencing down below. Yeah, the so, description. So, so, so the, you know, they're, they're talking about like uh, desecrating a, an execution location where somebody was stoned to death by a bunch of Khmer Rouge communist crazy guys was lapidated, stoned to death, literally beaten to death in the most archaic medieval way. And uh, yeah, you can't, that's not disturbing a grave. That's finding the remains of somebody who was viciously executed. And the people that viciously executed him, they thought they were smart enough to be able to conceal the remains in a way that they'd never be able to be recovered but yeah. that wasn't the case. Yeah, so I'm going to yeah, so jump I'm up gonna here on this up, on this uh, uh, witness, witness the interview that you guys did. You guys did. I'm going to share gonna a share little clip from, from it. it. Now, this is you in the Cambodian village. Yeah. And you're interviewing, interviewing this, this gentleman here, gentleman here uh, Dirk Chan. Dirk how do you suppose yeah. how do you say him? Yeah, Dirk Chan. Yeah. yeah, he was 15 years old at the, old at the time that uh, 
Sean and Dana disappeared, and he was a witness to an execution of a of a Caucasian. Is that, is that correct? Oh, well, yeah, he was he was a witness to the execution of a, a foreign journalist. This is what led me to the remains of the the person that I found in Cambodia, who we who we believe is to be a, a Japanese citizen. But um, I just want to clarify. So this is for a long time. There was this myth that had been perpetrated by particular authors that Sean Flynn and Dana Stone had survived in captivity for one year, but that is entirely inaccurate. They weren't moved around prisoner or war camps or anything like that. They were captured on April 6, 1970, and they were probably dead within tw 24 hours maximum. They were alive for 24 hours maximum after that. So um, because they were high profile, people were always looking for information about them to try to track them to try to find out where they were in pow camps just nobody knew that sean was killed it's just a similar situation like my grandfather like if you get killed out of the way of the people that are reporting on the war like it's hard for anybody to work out what happened to you but they were killed pretty much straight out all the guys that were captured there in cambodia that was a out on the border there's been a lot of myth about them being held in prisoner or war camps but the reality is is that was a kill that was a a kill like capture and kill operation that those local Khmer Rouge guys decided to do and it was like a crime of opportunity so um, the information that I followed here was information that said that Sean survived until 1971 so I tracked that information about the journalists and Sean surviving to 1971 to this field hospital in Kampong Chum. And as I said, in the Matt Frangiola report, Matt Frangiola report, it says that um, the, the, the field, the intern that worked at that hospital at the field hospital had said that he saw two foreigners held at that hospital this is 1970 late 1973 early 1974 that one was a white caucasian and that that looked like sean flynn and the other was a japanese so when i went to speak to this gentleman here this gentleman he he tells me that the person is a barang a caucasian but the in the reporting before I spoke to him because the U.S. government spoke to him three or four times it, before I got to him. It, he told them at first that it was a Japanese, but I think he, he changed the story as well because, like, um, I think he worked out it wasn't worth so much money to him when the people, the investigators were coming to speak to him if he was saying it was a, a, a an Asian. So he just kept on saying it was like an American or something like that. So, yeah. But essentially, the the thing is, is they were kind of confused about the the individual that was at this hospital because um, the one of the the doctors at the clinic had interviewed this journalist, and the journalist could speak um, English, French, Japanese, and uh, Chinese, and the journalist had told the the doctors that he was a japanese from america or he's an american japanese so uh -huh. yeah so this is this is so this guy here he led me to a grave site where one of the two people that were purported to be held at that hospital had been executed so when i was speaking to this guy i didn't know if he was speaking about the prisoner that was the Caucasian that was buried at this location or the other prisoner that was a Japanese that was buried at this location. But I just want to clarify, because I was working for Mike and Rory, we were there looking for Sean Flynn specifically. It's mm -hmm. just we didn't find Sean there that we found who we believed to be the remains of Taizo Ichinose, who was a Japanese journalist who went missing in 1973. And uh, so, yeah. I just wanted to clarify that before you start the video. Okay. Yeah, I'll just play a quick clip of it. I hope I got it in the right spot here. About 15 years old. Do you remember that thing? Or how the 
tell us what happened and name the name uh, before he told us about Mr. Samin. And can you tell us about what happened about, again? Just tell us again, please. please. Exactly what you tell us to do. អឺពុំមានដឹងអីពីមុនមកម៉ៃគេសលាប់អីបរទេសនឹងម៉ៃអីគេដំបងគេចងចងណាក៏អំទេះហាពុកធំខ្ញុំមកបន្ទះណាក
what led me to do it. And as I said, uh, I was skeptical at first of the guy. I don't know. I was just skeptical, but um, some things happened and then it confirmed, confirmed that I should have, I should at least try to um, investigate what he told me. And because at least I had an eyewitness, it's just unusual to um, get an accurate eyewitness or any eyewitness of things that happened at during that time in Cambodia. And I suppose because I, I'm an Australian and I'm a little, and uh, I lived in Southeast Asia for a long time. So sometimes I'm a little less skeptical than some U S uh, government investigators can be because sometimes if an old guy like that tells some information, maybe he's a dodgy person, you know, so maybe they, they, they don't act on information because for many years, there's a lot of inaccurate information and people that were, doing fraudulent things over there, like bone traders and stuff like that. Yeah, so for example, in the past, I've been criticized um, by uh, some authors, but uh, one author that I know, he claimed to have found Sean and Dana and uh, the remains that he passed off as being them in 1990, um, he, he bought them from a bone trader, specifically from a bone trader. And in Cambodia, they're, they're a really bad, really bad bunch of people. They just roll around the countryside trying to find information about Americans that were killed over there, or even if it's not Americans, Vietnamese or even Cambodians. And then they go and they dig their remains up and then go and try to sell them off as them being remains. So... Uh, in the past, there was a whole bunch of dodgy stuff like that that happened in Cambodia. Yeah, it's kind of hard to get um, information out of there because, you know, the, the Defense Intelligence Agency here in the United States has a kind of a subgroup called Stony Beach that deals with a lot of these Vietnam era MIAs. They're, all, they're, they're getting these reports all the time about, oh, yeah, these are American remains and you know, people turning them over and they're just, yeah, there's just, yeah, well, that's who, that's who Mike, Mike Luring and Michael Henshaw and my group have done a lot of contract work for before in Cambodia, yeah. Stony beach. Yeah. So exactly. Um, exactly. I want to send my love out to them. They're the, they're the greatest man. And, uh, and, are. and, and it's even also the DPAA. It's um, once, once you get, once you're close enough to be able to see the extent and the, the training and the, the specialized uh, training that's required and the extent that the United States government goes for us to find MIAs and then still high and guys like that go to be able to identify remains is once you're around that, um, I think it, it like changes the way that people see things because it's such a positive and life-changing experience and inspiring experience and um the dpaa and the stony beach dia they do amazing work and um uh they they get criticism but um i don't really believe that the criticism that they get is fair because it takes a long time to get results it can take up to 20 years sometimes to get an id after somebody's been recovered so um the process isn't a conventional process but people want conventional results out of the process and um, sometimes we've had some failures, but uh, the 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 successes that the DPAA and Stony Beach DIA have had, once they have successes, they're huge successes. So, right. Um, right. yeah, and when you consider the amount of time that's passed and uh, the amount of uh, people that we have recovered and accounted for, even now, this the problem now is the reason why we were working with ground penetrating radar in Cambodia is because the environmental factors have changed after 45 years or 50 years to the point that everything, the fossil record and the monsoon and the dry season, it, it it's made all of the graves drift down. So if you want to find a grave in Cambodia from 40, 50 years ago, whether it's American or Cambodian, whoever, Vietnamese soldier, you're looking at about 1.7 meters down as they're going to be about 1.7 meters down. So if you don't have GPR, it's very hard to find the otherwise to find the signature of where the, the grave is. For example, with that, with Taizo, we were lucky that we found the 308 bullet 
or the Japanese gentleman that we found out in Pakadong village, we found the 308 bullet and then we knew that the guy had been stoned to death. So when we were digging, all we had to do was hit stone. And as soon as we hit stone, we knew that the remains that were underneath that stone had already been lapidated. So we knew that we weren't going to be able to damage anything that was underneath there. We just kept on digging until we hit rock. And once we hit rock, we did everything by hand. We pulled it all out. And as we were pulling the rock out, like the skull fell out into my parts of the, the lapidated skull fell out into my hands and the gentleman's clothes. And uh, it was really uh, an emotional moment because uh, as soon as the, the, the guy's mandibular fell into my hand when we were digging, um, actually part of the skull, there were skull fragments and I, I had the skull fragments in my hand and I said to my Cambodian uh, translator guy, I said, man, this is coconut husky. This is coconut husky. He said, no, 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 calm down. No, no, no. I go, man, this is, co-. he's like, no, it's not coconut husk. That's human skull. That's what he said to me. He's like, I have that skull. Job, but I don't. Yeah. And then I pulled out, then I pulled out the, um, I pulled out the mandibula with the osseous, the, with porcelain infused crowns in there. That was in my hand that fell into my hand. And, uh, in the video, when you see the video, my hands are shaking, like my whole body is shaking. And there was this howl that all of the people in the community there let out. It was this, this shriek. It was this amazing feeling because as soon everyone was nervous. And then I, we started laughing a little bit and uh, giggling when we were finding the remains. And then all of the kids and all of the people that were watching – started to giggle and then all these people started to scream and shriek and like celebrate and it's just really this really strange how everybody in the village started to make this really strange like celebratory how when we found the remains because like to them that was a, a ghost that had been that had been haunting their village that had now been released you know for them from their from their spiritual belief that we'd freed their village from bad luck and from us we were just like well man we've just found an mia like the you know the f (laughs) the hell like i can't believe that and yeah as as i think i said to you before in our pre-interview like i was sitting there assuming that we weren't going to find anything i was just i prepared myself for the disappointment to go back with my tail between my legs and boom, we found, we found remains. We found uh, a a portion of the remains. But as I said, as we knew that um, the victim had been lapidated, um, had large stones, he'd been stoned to death, buried alive essentially, and large stones were thrown on top of him. So when people have had large, when people are killed by lapidation, large stones are, smashed upon their body like the trauma is it busts all of the bones flat into millions of pieces so with um with tight with uh who i believe is taizo ishinose the japanese individual that i found uh, i dug up out there in pakadong i found like uh, an arm and finger bones and and uh like the side of the face and skull fragments so I believe essentially what happened to him was um, they, when they stoned him to death, there was like one arm and side of a uh, side of his head that hadn't been bashed in with the rocks, and that is the portion that I was able to recover. The um, the U.S. government went in, they did a subsequent excavation there after I went in there, and they dug out that whole area like the same size as a football field, and they they found some uh, further remains there as well and uh, of of that individual but as i said that that individual was was lapidated and that's also in the u.s government uh, documentation to that large boulders that witnesses there had said that the the man that had been executed had been stoned to death by large boulders and that we had found that we had found large boulders inside that grave location and that jpac had went to a temple that's close by that had been bombed during the war and yep. they'd they'd worked out that the rocks from that temple were the same rocks that we found in the grave yeah yeah i and seen i they, seen yeah. that on the beach reporting you know 
yeah. from prior, you know, before you even did that explanation, there was there was some of that information in the Stony Beach reports, but they never they never followed up on it. Followed up on it. Yeah, well, it just comes down to um, being able to being being able to do that work, and uh, sometimes sometimes the the type of work that's required to find remains isn't conventional, and it. Um, it can't really be seen to be a part of uh, any any official effort, even if there's people in the background that want it to happen. Because it's it, you know the the amount of risk that we took for our personal safety. We, we didn't. I didn't have insurance out there. I didn't. I've never. When I was rolling out there in those areas where there's those landmines, I didn't have insurance. I didn't. I wasn't out there in a truck. I was there on a motorbike, like a 1984 Honda Dream or something like that, with Chinese parts in it. Um, <laughs> it, I, it. There was no. If I if I got into an accident out there, I would have been effed because there's like nothing. There's no hospital for like. It'd take me six hours to get to a hospital. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So there's not there's there's not too many people putting their hands up to put the shovel to the ground when it comes to those missions and me too like nowadays i'm i'm not so keen to put shovel to the ground um before the the work that we did with the stony beach was testing with the gpr and we we took the gpr to um uh, a former khmer rouge hospital i uh, know a former khmer rouge execution site in prey vang and um during that operation we were able to identify a hundred the graves of 189 individuals which was uh significant and we were able to do that with the radar and uh and yeah it, it was a significant victory for us and it was covered in the international press and uh so yeah that i i, I was working on the cases over there and um the excavation of that of that location in 2010 uh, it created so much controversy that after that, even though I continued to look for MIAs, um, whenever I was asked to do any exploration as far as like uh, further than using GPR and digging that I wasn't really keen to do it. Like I'll do surf, I'll do GPR or I'll do landmine clearance searches of an area. But it, um, after finding the remains, uh, I realized finding the finding remains is, the hardest part like it's not it is the hardest part in more than one way but once you've found remains like it's a very big responsibility and i had to take the before i handed the remains over to the u.s government rory and mike asked me to take it to the remains to the odon to logical academy and get that's where i got those dental x-rays from and to um take dna samples and all that type of stuff so um we found clothing as well in the grave and so i had we had to document all the things that we found before we handed it over to the u.s government and then keith rotherham and i went in and we did an official handover to the u.s government at the embassy in phnom penh and um it was it was very official but at the end of it uh, a whole bunch of u.s embassy staff came up to me and shook my hand and said thank you for what you've done, what you do for America and thank you for your service and all that type of stuff. So that was really, that was nice. That, that was a nice feeling. Um, the fact that we haven't been able to resolve the identification of this person. See, that's it. Like it's one thing I want to find an MIA. I want to find an MIA. That's one thing, but then boom, I have a John Doe. Oh, well, how many different candidates do I have? Like a hundred? Whoa. That's how it took me 10 years to be able to get to where we've gotten to now and believing that uh, in all probability that the remains that we found were those of Taizo Ichinose because um, even that guy was saying in that in that interview that you just play, played, he kept on saying 73, 74. This was 73 or 74. This is what he said in that interview. When he's speaking, he's, he's saying 73, 74. So... Um, uh, Taizo Ichinose and his uh, colleague, Japanese colleague, Koki Ishiyama, those guys, they were locked down in Phnom Penh during the bombing campaign of 73. And then the bombing campaign 
it ended in August and uh, Taizo and Koki, they started to go out in the countryside and try to secure a pass with the Khmer Rouge to go out to the villages and then see the, what had happened to the, the villages that had been bombed because they'd read a, an article that had an idealistic um, it was called Regrets from the Khmer Soul, which was uh, about this school teacher who joined the Khmer Rouge and he ran away and he wrote this um, article about his time there and it was an idealistic thing about the Khmer Rouge. So these Japanese guys, they figured that they'd be able to go in there and get an interview and see the Khmer Rouge and the Khmer Rouge would be nice to them and all this stuff. So they secured a pass into Khmer Rouge territory for three weeks. They were going to be moved throughout the territory and allowed to take photographs and document what they saw. And then at the end of that, th at the end of like the two weeks, they were going to arrive at the place where the um, authorities were and Gar, the, the central authorities like Pol Pot and those guys, and they were going to interview them. That's what the plan was. And then they were going to be allowed to go back over into Khmer Republic territory three weeks later. But um, they went over, and nobody really knows where they went over. They went over near, they went over near Phnom Penh somewhere in Phnom Penh. They because they didn't, they didn't tell anybody exactly where they were going. So the rumors always were that they were captured in Siem Reap going into Angkor Wat. But nobody, nobody knew exactly where they went, other than the Khmer Rouge, um, their Khmer Rouge contacts that they had to meet with, and they crossed over into Khmer Rouge territory on bicycles. So um, this is, I think, why the reporting on the in, in the old days was that it was Sean Flynn that was captured out there because there was this, um, that, that was being held out there because they there was this famous photographer that had been captured on a bicycle and Sean Flynn was a famous photographer that had been captured on a motorbike a few years earlier. So it was like mixing up in the reporting because there are so many individuals around there at that time as well, like Zalen Grant, I spoke to him and he said to me, you have to remember there's prisoners of all types, all American military prisoners, civilian prisoners, all different types of prisoners being moved around back over there. So everybody, and Sean Flynn was the highest profile one. So everybody, every refugee that was reporting something like that usually was reporting Sean Flynn because they saw it in the newspaper or something like that. So it wasn't uncommon for A lot of that. mixed up. And the reporting yeah, of the, reporting the two, uh, two uh, army deserters, army too. deserters too. Yeah, well, that that's the thing too. Well, we we thought that it could have been them. So those two army deserters, they were killed uh, about I think about four kilometers north of where I found the remains of this Japanese reporter, not that far off um, in Sanke Kong village, and that's where Tim Page bought the remains from a bone trader and. Uh, they, there were some bone traders that had dug up that grave a few years earlier and they still had remnants of the bones. They had kept some teeth and stuff like that. And that was in the documentary Danger on the Edge of Town. And uh, those remains were, were finally identified to be Clyde McKay. Or Clyde McKee. Yeah, I that's right. And, um, uh, but uh, Larry Humphreys still remains unaccounted for. And uh, nobody quite knows what happened to them, but... Um, the the mixing up and the reporting too could have been like because McKay was killed four kilometers north of there, he could have been held with Taizo Ichinose at the same time and then moved north and killed up there. Like, you know, so that that that's probably accounts for the the crossover in the reporting. Yeah. So uh, after you found these remains and got them disinterred, uh, you turned them over to the embassy there. Uh, embassy, uh, embassy got them over to the FBO WMIA County Agency. Well, I guess back then it was the uh, the predecessor to them. Yeah. They tested those remains and they, they came back. What, what, what did they come back as? Well, they came back saying that they weren't the remains of Sean Flynn, and uh, that's uh, that that's cool because um we but you know as I said at that time we were looking for Sean but we didn't. Just because you're looking for somebody and somebody's given you information that that person died 40 years ago, there's no and there's no like 100%. There's no confirmation that 
that that's going to be correct, especially when you're factoring in all these other people who it could have been because of the prisoners in that area and people that are still unaccounted for in that area. So, um, yeah, so uh, we found we found those remains and, and handed them over to the uh, DPAA or J, JPAC or JTF, whatever they were called at that time. Yeah. And then yeah. about six months, six months later, they got back to us saying that they weren't the remains of Sean. Then um, Rory re asked the government for uh, a report to let us know what we found. And if you see there, the, the reporting about that osseous, the, about the dental surgery on that person is very extensive. That's very detailed dentistry, right? Very detailed work, what they're speaking about. And um, there, there wasn't Cambodian people running around with that type of dental technology in their mouth at that time. The only place in the world that was doing surgery such as this were in Japan. And the problem was, was the osseous plates before the synthetic material, the quality wasn't that great. So people would have to get an, it, their, their mouth would finally like reject it after a few years. So the only country that mastered this surgery without uh, rejection of the foreign object inside the mouth back in the sixties was Japan. And so J Japan between 60 and 65, there's about 30 to 40,000 of these osseous surgeries done there. And that these, these type of detailed osseous surgeries, they weren't done again. They did once we didn't start doing these in America until the 1990s. Right. So there's nobody in there. So for before some of the, our detractors said, oh, it's a Cambodian. Well, if it's a Cambodian, how does that person have the most detailed Japanese dental um, technology from the 60s inside their mouth? If you're going to be digging somebody up from that time period, it's going to be very unusual that they're going to have that type of detailed level of osseous in their mouth because it was very yeah. uncommon at that time. Yeah, your average, your average Cambodian villager would not have that kind of deal. Yeah, so um, Michael Henshaw spoke to one of the doctors from Sill High, maybe I think it was 2016, and he said, hey, uh, you remember that case with that I worked on with Dave McMillan? Can you tell me anything that would bring us any further on it? And he said, oh, yeah, the, the haplotype that we tested was Japanese. The guy that you found was a Japanese. So that's when I went and I found Taizo and... Koki Ishiyama's guide in Cambodia, the guy who dropped them off and sorted everything out. And he started to tell me about these guys. And then uh, we landed at um, these two individuals to test. So we tested, um, uh, initially we thought it may have been Koki Ishiyama and Koki Ishiyama's son was easy for us to get to because he works as a journalist for uh, Nippon uh, Nippon Press at the Pentagon. He's a Pentagon reporter. Okay. So okay. Uh, the US government contacted him and they got a, a DNA sample and they tested a DNA, they tested um, the sample of the unidentified individual that we found uh, and they compared it with Koki Ishiyama's son's DNA sample and it was inconclusive. It was so it wasn't it wasn't him. And uh, we at that time, we didn't realize that Taizo Ishinose had never officially been accounted for in any way because a, a popular film called One Step on a Mine, It's All Over, was made about Taizo in 1998 in Japan, and it's like a cultural kind of icon type of film. It's like the Shawshank Redemption of MIA, Japanese MIA movies, and uh, it tells the story of Taizo and him going missing and him getting killed. And... Uh, it's a it's a very powerful movie, but Taizo's mother and father had come to Cambodia in 1981, and they went to see him rip with a Japanese film crew as part of a documentary, a Japanese television documentary. They found these Khmer Rouge, and the Khmer Rouge had told them that uh, they'd held Taizo up there and that they had his body, and then so the Khmer Rouge sold these remains. <laughs> Of, of an unidentified individual to Taizo's mum and dad. And Taizo's mum and dad took those 
the remains of that individual and washed the bones and prepared the bones for burial. And the thing was, was they didn't take those remains back to Japan with them because there was no identifying factors. There was no identifiers for them to, for ID, uh, for them to think tentative identifiers for them to believe that the remains that they were given were those of their son because, um, yeah, and, and so because of that, they didn't bring the remains back to Japan. The, the remains were cremated because the airline also didn't want them to bring the remains on there because they thought it could curse the airlines. So um, so the remains yeah. were left there. And then that happened in 81, but I found this report in 1989, this analyst in Bangkok who was a DIA analyst that was working on the case, and it was him. it was him like criticizing the whole thing. And he was like, there's not nothing to identify Taizo. These guys just sold this family a body, a, a random body. This is not real. This has got nothing to do with this guy's case. And um, yeah, they went and sold this family a bogus body. And the story that the Japanese are saying about this is this Taizo guy was killed here. We've got no proof at all to say that that, that this guy was killed in anywhere near this area. And it contradicts US reporting. So um, I didn't know that everybody had assumed that he was buried in Siem Reap because there's the bones that the Khmer Rouge sold and said were Taizos. The local Cambodians put them into a shrine in Siem Reap and created this grave for Taizo up there. But we didn't we didn't know that, like, in fact, he had went to Angkor instead of Angkor Wat. He went to Angkor. Angkor means the organization. That means the headquarters. And, uh, a lot of people thought that he was going to Angkor Wat, but the place where I dug the remains up there, that was referred to as Angkor in Zone 203. That was the Khmer Rouge headquarters. So he was taken to the headquarters to get the interview, but they they decided not to give him the interview and they held him captive for like five or six days and then they whacked him. Yeah. Yep. yep. Crazy. Crazy. That's yeah, great. so I mean, it, you see, like the way the the criticism that we get about this is always like, oh, people didn't like you. Oh, these people had a tough headed, they had a hard headed approach to things. Yeah, well, we get things done. My family in America, they live in Vegas, they live in Nebraska and in California. We don't, we don't like mess around, and uh, we got results. So these guys, they want to. They want to talk about rumors and insult people and make up disinformation. And they don't want to do the noble and the ethical thing, which is there's a John Doe here. And the, this person is most probably related to all of these other individuals, these journalists and stuff as, as a colleague. So why don't we do the good thing and bring this guy back? Well, it's because they want to, they want to try to, say some disreputable things about me to try to damage my credibility. But I've been out there doing work. I never saw any of these cats out there when I was out in the middle of the, those minefields looking for MIAs, man. I never saw any of my critics. They didn't pass me out there. They, they won't go and pass me in a convoy to go and investigate the same case or anything like that. So they criticized me in that way because they don't want to look at the fact. The fact is, is that Taizo Ishinose going home to Japan would be a very big deal and it would be a very big victory for America. And that's what I'm trying to do. That for me, that, that would be to restore some American prestige, some prestige for America. I may be Australian, but it's that's what it's about. And some prestige to the American State Department, State Department. who's responsible yeah. for these, for these uh, civilian MIAs. Yeah, well, I, you know, I as I said, I'm just a lowly Australian servant. I'm not an American citizen. That's kind of the strange thing about me because in Vietnam, I work for the Vietnamese and I'm a servant to the Vietnamese people and to the Vietnamese government. And inside Cambodia, I work for America and I'm a servant to America and the American government inside Cambodia. So, or I was before, that was my former employment for about 15 years on and off. I was doing these things. My group was doing these things over there. And, uh, working on these projects and working at, in contract and volunteer capacity on these investigations for the um, 
for for you us agencies you know as i said there's agencies have changed their name there's a lot of competitiveness in the united states but and within the agencies but it's only because we're the best in the world and i i'm sorry like the people in my country they don't like to hear me say it but americans we're the best like when it comes down to doing things in in a proper way the americans are the best in the world like the most capable the best military minds the best training and all those type of guys like the the best guys i've ever met man they're all american military and uh we're very american military is very capable my work with the american military was sp specifically a humanitarian mission to recover the remains of u.s civilian and also u.s um uh personnel military personnel so um i worked specifically on s civilian cases but i also worked as i said uh, the Jerry Shriver case and some other cases like uh, yep. in Cambodia. The Jerry Shriver case is a case that I is is a bee in my that I've got is a bee in my bonnet that I want to uh, resolve after COVID. Um, I would sure love the, if I would sure love if my commander. Family. Yeah, I'm sure the Shriver yeah. family would love that too. Well, our our group Sparrowhawk Global that we've that we run out of California our um, we we have a our ground we have that ground penetrating radar technology that we're using over there in Cambodia. It's still up to date. It's still ready to go. So I'm hoping a, again in the future after all of this stuff clears at Sparrowhawk Global, we can reactivate our um, our GPR capabilities. And I want to look for some um, some people in Cambodia, including. Uh, mad dog jerry shriver but also specifically I, i'm interested in taking it to the kokoda trail in papua new guinea to look for some australian mias from world war ii because there's not really much being done up there and i think like right. it's probably some lower hanging fruit for somebody like uh, me and my team sparrowhawk for us to work on and uh some of the stuff in the pacific uh af actually after becoming a fan of your podcast i've become much more interested in world war ii cases and being in australia i'm not that far away from where a lot of those pacific cases are so in the need future to, i'm definitely interested in that need to get you into indonesia you got one for you already okay <laughs> it's not far from here no not well yeah it's a gross lie anyway yeah well i've got a whole bunch of friends that have good contacts there in indonesia so oh good yeah okay yeah, we'll have to talk offline about that. I'll share a podcast with you about it. Cool, man. So, so where are you going from here? Uh, so, I'm not sure what what kind of spurred this on was. There was a video that was put online a couple of days ago, as you were talking about before, and it was referencing the recovery, and it was pretty rude and pretty crazy some of the stuff that they said there like they accused us of being scavengers and stuff it's like man so i used a magnetometer to find a 308 and then we dug down and we found all these rocks and then we moved all the rocks and then we found these bones and that's like the work of a scavenger and people were accusing us of um accusing yeah, us of being this like recovery, uh, this recovery was made out in a rice field where there's no rocks so yeah. you knew everything matched up to your witness statement you found the the bullet you dug down until you fell in the rock and then you delicately took yeah, the rock well, until you found yeah. somewhere that's it john exactly you know like it, it was that simple it was just it was it was textbook simple exactly but they want to complicate the complicate it and try to report it and uh, twist and bend the narrative in a way that makes it look like finding the remains of MIAs is a bad thing. It's like I always thought that Americans told me that that was the best thing, not like yeah. just a good thing. It's the best thing. These 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 people, these critics, you know, uh, what I'm getting out of all of it, not not from you, just the whole situation as a whole. Is they're trying to profit off of Charles Flynn or Earl Flynn's name. Earl Flynn's name. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And, you know, you know, a lot of this isn't, isn't about Sean Flynn. Yeah, exactly. 
and that they don't understand that. But that that was kind of like the starting point that got me into all of this stuff is Sean. And um, as I said, I've been working for Rory and Mike for since um, 2009. One of the coolest things that ever happened, man, I'll tell you one of my American stories quickly is I went over to California there with Mike and Rory. She took me on a date in, in uh, California. We went to, we went to a coffee shop and she introduced me to Hank Soroyan, who's William Soroyan's son, the famous writer. Armenian writer and then she took me to um Lego on the what is it Lego Lego on the Coronet Lego on the Coronet which is this club in Hollywood and uh she took me there and she introduced me to uh Thomas Jane the guy who played the Punisher and uh Rose McGowan so she introduced me to Rose McGowan this was before the Me Too movement and Rose McGowan she was playing Marilyn Monroe in a stage show at the Lego on the Coronet and Rory took me there and uh, yeah, we've got, we got a picture took, taken of her and I there, which is pretty crazy because I'm six, five and Rory's about six foot one. And uh, when I was there at that, at that do that night, we were having drinks and the lighting was low and Rory had to go over to speak to somebody and she walked past me and like the way that she walks and the way that she looks and everything is just like Errol Flynn, like just like her dad. It was like, did Robin Hood just walk past me? Like when you see the silhouette, <laughs> she like looks the same as him. She walks the same. She moves the same. And um, yeah, she's a really, she's a really lovely lady. And um, Rory and Mike have been super supportive of me and the mission and we've had times where things have went to the dogs over there and then Rory and Mike have pulled me out of really tight situations when we're over there searching for Sean over in the past because, yeah, I must, tell, I must admit, like, the type of work that um, we're involving ourselves in looking for Sean was very dangerous from a political perspective, not just from, like the Southeast Asian countries or from the United States or from, from Australia, just in general to be involved in something which is so con- it's con- it's a controversial subject yes. and you become automatically controversial when you find the remains of a missing person. But you know, what is more important about this is it the controversy or is it the humanitarian side of it? Is it is the fact that we, the United States and Australia can to get work together to, put together this amazing accomplishment. Um, Taizo's mother and father, they passed away and they they were the, the gatekeepers of his legacy right up until the time that he passed away. Like, I mean, right up until the time they passed away, which was only about five to 10 years ago. And um, his mother, she had all of his photographs and uh, she, she developed his film and created all these books and she was the force behind the movie. And there their um, goal, their end goal always was that they wanted Taizo's remains to be in their shrine, their family shrine in Kyushu. So now their mother and father, they're in that shrine in Kyushu. And if uh, people, if if my colleagues and, and uh, even if people don't consider me as a colleague, they just consider me as an Australian explorer or whatever, or the Australian Rambo, right? Uh, <laughs> if you guys, if you guys have just consider me that way, like Australians and uh, Americans, we're cousins also. I've got a whole bunch of cousins over in America. And uh, this is an American, this can be an American and Australian accomplishment. And, uh, uh, you know, even with the, with the administration and with the State Department and everybody, like this is a type of, this is some American prestige that's pretty easy for us to put together. Or if the guys at Sill High, they t- over at Hickam, if they took this case off the shelf and they started to look at it, I think very quickly they would come to the, the same determination as you and I have after looking at all the evidence. Right. Well, and, and see, the evidence isn't some something that I've just, come up with as you know this all this evidence that i've put together is actual dia reporting which uh, dod reporting which had been declassified and put into the library of congress right correct correct so uh, like um i'm not coming i'm not coming up with some crazy concept it's like i'm just agreeing with what the u.s government's been saying about it and saying yep that's right well if if um the information that we have about Taizo and the information that the U S government has about the, 
the Japanese journalist that was killed in Pakadong, the those narratives and the timelines match. Right. And right. there's only one other candidate, and we've already disqualified that candidate. And uh, as I said, Taizo Ishinose was a famous baseball player in Japan, and he had some very bad damage to his jaw. And it, it's known that he had damage to his jaw. He had scar, scars all over his face. You can see on all, all along here he had scars because he got either hit by a bat or a baseball. And he had to get reconstructive surgery. Where the reconstructive surgery was, there was scars where the doctors had to cut the incisions to do the surgery. You can see those scars. They never healed on his face. If you take the jaw, the picture of the mandibula that I have, and you overlap that on the photographs of Taizo Ishinose, you see that the drill hole on the mandibula and the, the scars on Taizo's face, they match up. So Taizo, we know Taizo Ishinose had an osseous. He had an osseous. He's known to have had an osseous. The person we found was a Japanese from Kyushu that's, that had an osseous. So there, there wasn't many other people in the world at that time that had that surgery. It's very unusual surgery. Yeah, exactly. exactly. That's why it's important for these families to uh, provide their family reference sample DNA. Yeah, for sure. And um, I, don't, I don't see um, COVID slowed everything down, but like the guys that are doing things officially or, and the contractors and the volunteers and the people that are doing things outside of the U S government, there's still a lot of people that have the will to bring people home and are never, ever going to give up. We're never going to give up. You are never forgotten. You're not forgotten. We have that attitude and um, we live and die by that. As I said, Donna, she was over there in her fatigues up there in the mountains in, in Kaysan looking for her brother and uh, she passed away. She ended up getting cancer and passing away a few years ago. And uh, she and I were very close friends and she was a researcher with me. And her, her um, objective always was that she was never going to stop until she could bring Jerry home. Well, she, she went home before she could do that. But um, right. there's a lot of people that are still committed to bringing the, our service people home. And we don't, always hear about it but you know the as i said the type of work that all of the u.s agencies involved in uh, pow accounting have done and do is amazing yes it is yes it is well is there anything that we've, anything that we've forgotten to talk about or anything you want to i don't think so do you have any questions I think we can go uh, yeah i think we can go on forever with this, you know to be honest yeah man do you have any questions not, not, I haven't seen any in the comments, but, uh, but uh, no, I think, uh, I think uh, we covered it pretty good. And pretty like, good. I said, like I said, you know, kind of to summarize it all, it's not all about one person. You know, you might be looking for one person and it's going to lead you to another. You never know, you never know where it's going to lead you. And, and uh, yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, it's like, with, yeah, with these cases, it's like I was born in 1981, so I couldn't I couldn't work out, I I couldn't determine who was going to be buried in that exact location in 73 or 74. I couldn't confirm until I dug up the lo location whether or not it was Sean or if it was a Japanese guy or who it was. I I couldn't confirm that until I put shovel to ground. And as I said, that's a the opening up Pandora's box. Once that happens, it is opening up Pandora's box. Yep. Like exactly. David Letterman, David Letterman made a joke about the controversy on his show at that time about, he made a joke about Sean Flynn's son's been found in Cambodia. He said something cheesy, like um, there was a whole bunch of swash and buckle nearby or something. That's what David Letterman said. So like, that and so then after that, that's when everybody started to like comment and stuff because it went kind of crazy viral that we'd found these remains and that people had assumed that it was Sean because we were there looking for Sean. So we didn't miss we didn't misguide anybody and say that 100% that we found Sean. We said that we'd found the remains of an MIA at the location that we were looking for Sean at, and then we gave it to the U.S. government for them to test and to determine whether it was Sean. And we were all hopeful at that time that it was Sean, but we found out it wasn't Sean, it's a Japanese individual. So that's kind of what 
triggered this very long, very long investigation process, research process. When I was in Vietnam, I um, I went through the, like the the that uh, DIA blacklist online about that that has all of the MIA POW cases listed on there that for for the days. It's just endless and endless. So. I had to go through all of those cases and cross-reference those cases to determine whether or not the person that I found out there was any one of those individuals. So the amount of cross-referencing that we went through to be able to determine that we found ties that we should not say was incredible. And it's the statistics of us actually being able to get to a tentative identification with uh, only knowledge of the fact that we have a Japanese DNA, but without doing the DNA test yet we have a very strong tentative identif um, identification that is ties even pre-dna so for me i just see it, it it's all net man it's slam dunk for the u.s if we can do this and it's slam dunk for australia and the u.s if we can return the remains of taizo home to japan that's a large diplomatic victory for our countries in light of what just happened for our countries in Afghanistan, like Australia and America, we need some victories and we're allies. We're not enemies in any way, man. I know yeah. sometimes my American friends, they get pissed off if I speak about American politics, but Hey, like uh, I try to avoid talking about it, but sometimes I've got to have a laugh about it either side because, you know, it's just sometimes there's some funny things that happen in American politics. It, 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 sometimes it, it's the best thing happening on television, right? American politics. So, um, <laughs> Over the last all of my friends, yeah, yeah, all my friends that are in, into into the uh, politics business too, they understand that I'm a smart ass. I always like to have a joke about all that stuff, but I'm a I'm a good member. I'm a good I'm a good helper. Yeah, but, exactly. Uh, yeah. exactly. I just, I just hope that I hope that we can, that we can uh, bring this victory home. And I know that um, a whole bunch of people from the U.S. military are probably been listening to this podcast. I just want to send out my love and respect to the U.S. military, and I also want to acknowledge my friends in the Vietnamese police and the Vietnamese military who are now deployed in Ho Chi Minh City, and they're helping to bring the COVID pandemic, the fourth outbreak in Vietnam, under control. A lot of those guys, they're my students over the years that I was in Vietnam. I'm very proud of them. Now is a very stressful time for me because we have both uh, the U.S. military doing the evacuation in, Cam uh, in Kandahar, or is it? Yeah, in Afghanistan, and also I have all of my friends in the Vietnamese military deployed in Ho Chi Minh city. So it's, it's, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm just concerned about everybody's welfare. So guys, if you're out there, if you're hearing this, you keep safe and you keep your head down, you keep focused, keep your eye on the prize and, uh, know the tricks, know the traps, uh, one step on a mine, it's all over as Taizo said. And when he said that he was talking about Robert Kappa, the famous American photographer that stepped on a mine in North Vietnam in 1954. As he said, yeah. that's what he said before he went to the countryside. He said, just like Robert Kappel, one step on a mine, it's all over. So, yeah. yeah. And it is. And it is. Yeah, man. Right. Well, David, I appreciate you joining me on. Joining me on. Thanks John for having me on, man. And uh, we're going to have to do it again. We're going to have to. Yes, sir. To Anytime. Sometime and um, just stick with me here. I'm going to do this outro. Um, okay, no worries. Uh, yeah, this outro is actually, is actually a colleague at Jerry Schreiber's that was just identified here a few years ago and brought home yes, to his sister. So stick with me when it's over. We'll get on and talk afterwards. Okay, God bless America, sir. <laughs> you do. Thanks. See you later. Above our land, flags so proudly hail. Be proud of this America. Realize.
bring a missing man back home Prisoners of war And am I is America What are we waiting for? Bring them home, bring them home Eagle flies in chains Until we have them home again Eagle flies in chains That's not all America Not only bullets kill The ones we sprayed With Agent Orange Are sick and dying still Can't forget the combat vet or wish his war away. His legacy, America, is living day. Flies and chains until we have them home again. The eagle flies in chains. War it seemed so long ago. Sam forgets it was not over for missing men sick and dying vets bring them home bring them home eagle fly Till we have them